Welcome everyone. Uh, apologies for the slightly clunky start. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, thumbs up if you can. Um, good, excellent, brilliant. Uh, my name is Brent Caffin, uh, Executive Director of States of Change. Uh, we're in week two of the festival and this session is called We Will, We Will Nudge You. I didn't realise that you'd actually done that twice until I listened to the song. <laughs> um, and we're, we're delighted to have uh, Ol, uh, Jonathan Boyne and Flora from uh, Argentina. Um, you've read the bio, so I'm not going to uh, waste any more of their precious time. Um, but I really look forward to hearing the session about behavioural insights in public policy design. Uh, over to you, Ol. Thank you. Thank you, Brenton. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session. We will, we will nudge you. Um, it's going to be a really interactive session. Uh, and if you have any question during the session, please um, do write it down in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask uh, your question or, or also share your opinions, ideas, experiences. Just let me um, share my screen. So, yep. Um, can everyone hear me and see the, the presentation? Yeah, thumbs up. Good. So um, the session is kind of inspired and, and the theme of the session is Queen and rock music. So we kind of want to connect nudge and, and, and behavioral science with rock. So some of the objectives of this, of this session is to encourage you to use behavioral science to apply in public policies or really anything you want. Uh, it doesn't have to be only public policies. You can, I think that behavioral science, you can use it, apply it also with your partner, with your family, with your kids, um, because we have one brain, right? So uh, it kind of applies for, for everything we want. The second session, uh, the second objective of this session is to know other rockers around the world who share the same interest in applying behavioral science or behavioral insights. So I guess that everyone that is here in this session is because we share the same interest. And the last objective is maybe form a nudge band. Um, I think that uh, this is still an emerging methodology. Uh, so we kind of uh, want to map everyone that is out there all over the world that have an interest or have applied uh, these kind of things into public policies. So yeah. But most importantly, I think we think that the most important thing of this session, as Queen said, is to have a real good time. Um, so this is a fragment of Don't Stop Me Now. I'm not going to sing it because I'm a terrible singer. But um, it is really important for us to have a really good time during this session. Um, you'll see that it's uh, a quite interactive session. We'll uh, split you in breakout rooms and they're going to be like hands-on exercises. Um, so if anyone don't feel comfortable, don't really feel comfortable with that, it's okay. Uh, you can just tell us or chat us in privately and you could do more a reflection by yourself. So um, here's a quick poll I want to do to kind of understand the, hang on, uh, the audience here. So I'm just gonna bring up this one. So here's the the first poll, um, and we have a question for you, which is, how familiar are you with behavioral science? So the first the first answer is, I'm a behavioral science ninja. Like I apply it at work every day, and I rock at it. Uh, then. I can talk about it to impress someone you like. We all have done uh, that, but I've never actually applied it. Uh, the third option is, oh, okay, I heard about it a couple of times, but I put a poker face about it when it comes up in meetings. And the last answer is like behavioral what? Am I in the wrong session? So, There are still three people that haven't answered. We'll give a couple of seconds more. There are two people.
Great. Um, so can you see the results? Or should I, I do I have? Okay, as we can see, uh, most people like 70% of you can talk about it to impress someone you like. Okay, we can all do that. Uh, but I have never actually applied it, which is a good thing because we are trying, to, we are gonna try to apply some of the tools and methodologies of behavioral science today. There are some people, two people actually, that have uh, applied it. So those two, if you are willing to share uh, during the session how you applied any of the, the tools we are going to explain, it's gonna be awesome. And then there are a couple of people that heard about it a couple of times, but they put a poker face uh, whenever it comes up in a meeting. Great, let's go back to the presentation. Luckily, no one is in the wrong session. Yeah, that, that's a good thing. <laughs> so um, how are we gonna evolve today? Um, here's the schedule of today's Lola Palusa. Um, we're gonna have, take about 15, 20 minutes to nudge 101, which is going to be like a brief introduction for those who don't know that much about uh, behavioral science applied to public policies. And then we're gonna start the rock and roll. Um, we are going to uh, do some exercises in different breakout rooms and then share maybe uh, the outcomes of those exercises. And the whole session is gonna take us uh, about one hour and a half. So yeah, who we are. Um, today in the Nudge Band, I'm me, um, old Jonathan Beon, I'm from Argentina. I worked as a director for capability building and innovation at the government lab of Argentina. And a, a funny fact, a fun fact about me, I'm a huge fan of second dinners. Uh, what does it mean? Like, I actually like eating second dinners. I always have dinner really early. Uh, and by 12 a.m., I have a second dinner. Yeah, don't judge me, please. Hi everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I'm Flora, I work at Sao Paulo City Hall in an innovation lab and I lead the behavioral science initiatives up there. And well, my fun fact, it's not that fun, but I'm really obsessed about running and, and yeah, that's what I wanted to share with you. Hope you enjoyed the session. Sweet. Um, the funny thing about this session is that Flora is from Brazil. I'm from Argentina. There's like a historic rivalry uh, against Argentina and Brazil, but we have come together. Thank you. Thanks to States of Change to collaborate on this session. So it's kind of for those who like football, it's kind of when Messi and Neymar played together at Barcelona. So we are not as good as Messi and Neymar, but maybe almost. Okay. Um, so we're gonna do a quick second poll. So yeah, there, here are like uh, two questions. Uh, it's a quiz. And uh, the first one says, Linda is 31 years old. She's single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in, in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear anti demonstrations. Which is more probable? A, that Linda is a bank teller, she works at the bank, or B, that Linda is a bank teller and a feminist. She works at the bank and is also a feminist. And the second question, it goes like, which do you prefer? A, losing a hundred bucks for sure, or B, a 90% of a chance of losing a hundred dollars? So. There are only three people left to vote. We'll give it one more, a couple of more seconds. Okay, uh, we can. So, 
So uh, the results uh, are in the screen. You can see it. Like it's almost half, a half, um, like 48% of you voted that is, it is more probable that Linda is a bank teller and 52% on said that Linda is a bank teller and a feminist. Um, is someone like want to share why they answered whatever they answered? You can unmute and explain your answer if you want. Or not. Okay. Um, so the, the rational choice of the first question should be Linda is a bank teller because Linda is a bank teller and a feminist. That, those are two conditions. And one of the conditions like are included in the other answer. So if you're talking about probability, the more probable outcome would be that Linda is a bank teller. But because I have a uh, told you the description of the stereotypical person of a feminist, 52% of you uh, answered that she, it is more probable that Linda is a bank teller and a feminist, right? And in case two, which do you prefer? Like only two people answered or 10% answered that they prefer losing a hundred bucks for sure. And most of us, um, we prefer a 90% chance of losing. Oh, okay. Uh, that answer is wrong. Um, sorry, it should be a 90% chance of losing 115 bucks. But the, the, the main uh, message here is that we all have a, a optimism bias. We are really optimistic about the chances that are related to ourselves. And we are really bad at calculating probabilities and, and statistics. And this has to be, this is related to uh, how irrational we are. We are not very rational. We don't make very rational choices every day. Uh, we usually make a, a lot of irrational choices and Flora is going to talk a little bit about that. So let me stop sharing. Yep. So, well, after this quick warm up, let's start with 101 on applied behavioral science. And our starting point is traditional economic theory, which would be neoclassical economics. And this whole area based itself on building models in order to be able to analyze and predict how people and firms would make choices in a society. And in order to build these models that would allow us to generalize a lot of situations, they, those models were based on some assumptions. And in a really simplified way is that people always know what their preferences are, so they're self-conscious of themselves. And they are consistent within different situations. So external factors wouldn't affect what they prefer. And also that people will always choose the best thing so that they will behave in a maximizing and optimizing way, always looking for the best option. And the third assumption is that people will behave in a self-interest way. So doing what's best for, the, for them according to their the incentives available. Well, of course, these assumptions do not do not always hold in real world, right? So we have situations like that. I think the photo is self-illustrative, but it shows how we're not always, always consistent with our preferences. And well, another good example is, I think you can, yeah. Like this one, I think most of you have gone through it, but some every time when you're trying to decide what you watch on Netflix, we spend, we spend a lot of time trying to check all the options and we end up giving up or going back to our default TV show. This is an example when having too much information, too much information, which would be best from a standard theory point of view, actually leads to a worse choice. And so all this matters because it affects us in a systematical way. And if it affects everyone, it should be included in this model. And also it affects society in really important uh, issues. So as policymakers, taking in, into account these irrational behaviors is a huge challenge and uh, should be taken into account to design more efficient public policies. For example, in the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of things weren't quite uh, rational, but it's important to understand why this happened, how this happened, and what can we do to uh, try to fix it or make a better social outcome out of it. And well, if you're here, I'm pretty sure you've heard some of this concept. And when I was starting into this 
new word, I got confused on how they differ and what they actually mean. Uh, those concepts are indeed different, but when we're talking in an applied uh, point of view, they usually refer to the same thing or almost of the same thing. So uh, the point is what we're going to present here has to do with all those terms and nudge is the specific kind of application of behavioral science. So it will be like a, a tool of this area. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, we brought here the nudge definition by the authors themselves, so Teller and Sunstein, which is nudge is any aspect of the choice architecture, which is uh, how a decision is presented back to someone, so how the options are presented. That alters people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. So the nudge is going to encourage, to give the gentle push into a certain option that's alleged to be bad for the, the decision maker, but it will not prevent someone to choose otherwise. Nudges usually are really simple, cheap, uh, transparent, and scalable interventions that um, tend to favor what is best for the person and from a, for a social outcome. And when Teller and Sunstein published the book in 2008, they strongly encouraged governments to uh, start nudging their citizens in a term they coined as libertarian paternalism. In a really simplified way, what we're going to talk about today is design public policies and services that are based on how people truly make decisions and not how they ideally should decide. And I think this is a really important thing about behavior and science. And for those of you, you who are starting in the area, here are some really uh, nice books to give an introductory of overview of the field. So Thinking Fast and Slow from Daniel Kahneman, it's uh, where we took the quizzes from the first uh, part of the session. So if, if you're interested of knowing more, then as I mentioned, Teller and Sunstein's Nudge and Ariel is Predictably Irrational. And yeah, in the last few years, behavioral insights has really grown in importance in the world, especially in applied areas. So as you can see, it grew from nothing to be a really trendy uh, topic, a trendy thing, especially in this innovation and in the governmental area. So I think, yeah, this is a OECD map of behavioral public policy units around the world. So units that are actually applying behavioral science to uh, governmental issues and as you can see it has really spread since David Cameron and Barack Obama first applied in their administrations in around 2010. So in 10 years it has gone all over the world first uh, in Europe and North America and Australia and now we're seeing a lot of applications in Latin America, Africa and Asia as well. And this map is quite outdated because it for example it doesn't show uh, our unit here in Sao Paulo. So it has even grown bigger. And now I pass the word back to all who explain a bit more about those concepts. So yeah, um, most, uh, most of you is probably familiar with the concept of system one and system two thinking. So this is based on Daniel Kahneman's work. System one is the fast automatic uh, way of making decisions. And it's the system that we use to take most of the decisions every day. There are some research that says it's almost 95% of the decisions. And then the system two is the more rational and conscious uh, system of making decisions or thinking, right? So uh, system one is uh, biased by cognitive biases. So what is a cognitive bias? It's a systematic um, deviation from rationality in judgment or decision making. So it is basically a systematic error in the way we think or make decisions. And it is not something that we can ignore or suppress. It is something that we have to live with, but we can be more conscious about it. And there are a lot of biases, like the one really famous is the confirmation bias. And you uh, know about this one um, if you have ever tried to argue with, with someone that thinks that the earth is flat. Um, they're convinced that the earth is flat and they will uh, look of all the evidence and information that what it does is to reconfirm their own uh, uh, beliefs. So this is uh, about confirmation bias. 
Then uh, there's another really famous bias, which is availability bias, which says that um, we usually make decisions based on the information, the last, the latest information we have in our heads. And if we think about which is the most, uh, the animal that kills most people every year, what do you think it is? Um, a lot of people say, oh, maybe the shark, uh, snakes, um, uh, hippopotamus, because you want to watch a National Geographic documentary, but actually it's the mosquito. And um, that is a really surprising uh, outcome. And the most surprising outcome of this is that dog is the fourth animal that kills most people per year. And you think, oh, really, the dog? But the dog is so friendly. And that's because there's like a stereotype or, or, or there's a lot of information that put dogs in a really friendly image and not as a dangerous animal. Also, there's a really interesting bias, which is called anchoring bias, which uh, kind of says that we make decisions based on how the different options are presented. So there, here's a really interesting experiment where they ask uh, people or participants, how happy are you? And then how often do you have dates? And the correlation was really low, uh, 0.11. So how happy are you? Oh, I'm really, really happy. How often do you have dates? Oh, I never have dates. And then they did the same thing, but they altered the, the sequence of the answers. So how often do you have dates? Oh, I never have dates. How happy are you? Oh, I'm so miserable. So the correlation went up to uh, 0.62. So we can see how presenting choices in different order can alter the decision of people. And the insight here is that we can take a rational approach to these irrationalities in order to improve decisions. So, for instance, um, the Behavioral Insights team in the UK did an experiment and they came up with that um, how defendants are presented in, in a court can affect the decision of judges. When they're presented behind the glass, judges tend to um, rule against them on 60% of the times, and when they're presented next to the lawyer, it uh, decreases considerably. Also, another case is uh, uh, related to the organ donation. The countries that we can see in the blue bar um, are countries that the, they have as a default option that everyone is willing to donate organs, and those countries um, with the yellow bar are those countries that for default, they have, uh, I'm not willing to donate organs. So we can see how something simple as the, pre, the, the default option can alter the behavior of people. And in something really impor important, such as organ donation. Another case is uh, with tax collection. Um, here's an experiment of the UK government where in the um, letter that comes to the taxpayer or the citizens, they added a sentence that says nine out of 10 people pay the, their tax on time. And this generated a, a 5% increase of tax recollection, which represents a lot, a lot of money. Or in Denmark, they printed um, like footsteps and they painted the trash bin and this uh, decrease on 46% the street leader in those streets, streets that were intervened. So how do we apply it? Well, there's a, a really easy to apply a methodology of the BIT of the Behavioral Insights Team, which is the tests methodology, which is basically target defining which behaviors you want to change and how are you going to measure then exploring, understanding the, the context and using social anthropology apology methodologies to interview and, and, and better understand the users. Then think about different solutions using cognitive biases. Then trial, um, like prototyping and testing your, the different nudges that you have came up with. And then finally scaling the solution if it works. And for those who are familiar with the human-centered design methodology, it is quite similar. Like, um, there are only a couple of differences between the two methodologies. So the human-centered design is more generalistic, and you can uh, actually measure the prototypes in a more 
qualitative uh, way, but the test methodology focuses more specifically, specifically in behaviors, and you kind of need data and a quantitative approach in order to measure interventions. But those who are already working in public innovation using human-centered design, um, it's really, you need just to make a, a couple of things uh, differently in order to make it a behavioral science project. So this is too much blah, blah, blah. I'm probably sure, I'm sure that you're probably uh, aware of these concepts. So let's rock. Okay, so we're going to start our practical, practical part of the workshop. Uh, so what we'll do is divide you up in uh, breakout rooms. So you'll be in groups and you will be in the same group throughout the rest of the session. So you do a lot of activities together and please do interact and do tell what you think. Don't feel ashamed or something like that. The intention is to create a practical group, group thing. So the first activity we want you to do is to define a challenge. So reflect with your team some a behavioral challenge that you want to act on. And we thought it would be nice to relate to something that is relevant for your daily life right now. So think about your family or the people you live with. Is there any challenge that you're facing? Like um, right now with coronavirus, with we are facing a lot of behavioral change challenge. So I think you can uh, pass up to. And so for example, now we have to wash hands more often or we are having kids at home and maybe we want them to help at home or do something or also when we are receiving a package or food, we have to take a lot of care. So those are all, uh, all behavioral challenges that you might work on that it's relevant for your day, but also it does not have to be uh, related to coronavirus specifically. So I can share a, a great example. So yeah, it doesn't have to be uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, maybe you are tired of listening and talking about COVID-19. So here's another example of how uh, a challenge I found. So I'm doing the quarantine, uh, the self-isolation at my parents' house with my family. And in front of my parents' house, there's always dog poop. So you can see a lot of dog poop here. Um, so basically people that are working, walking their dogs, they don't always pick up their poop um, and they just leave it there. So yeah, there's dog poop everywhere, which this stresses my parents a lot. Um, so I came up with the challenge. So about how might we nudge dog owners to pick up their dog poop in front of my parents' house? And if you see the challenge, if you analyze the challenge, there's always a, a person like who and a what and a where and a when. So when you um, are thinking about which challenge do you want to come up with or identify, please take into consideration who uh, behavior you are going to change, in what sense and where or when. So um, we are going to divide you in breakout rooms. Just give me one second. So um, in the chat, what you will see is that we've put a link uh, to a Google Drive. And if you uh, join the Google Drive, what we'll see, it's a different um, worksheet. And once we assign you to a breakout session, what you'll do is to go to the number of your breakout session in the folder, and you'll have assigned a, a worksheet. And then you're going to use that worksheet in order to do all the exercises that we are going to do for uh, the next hour. Any question that you have, you can ask us, you can raise your hand, and we can jump into the different breakout room sessions to help you. Uh, but either way, we're going to go to the different breakout rooms to help you and, and, and hear to you and listen of what you're saying. So, yep, uh, boom. So you've already been invited to participate in different breakup rooms. See you in a while. Yeah, don't worry, Maria. And 
uh, Lucia, when as soon as she arrives, we put her in a room. I think they're not here anymore, right? So if people are having trouble getting into the breakout rooms, just maybe mention it on the chat and we can help you get into them. There are people that are having trouble getting to the breakout rooms? Uh, I'm just, well, there are there's just a number of people who haven't joined a breakout room yet. So maybe they've chosen not to. Um, oh yeah, I, presume. I, I think, yeah, there are some people that um, chose not to do the activities, but that's okay. So I think everyone should be back here. So okay. Flora. Yeah. So the next activity is to think about this behavioral challenge you've chose. And then you complete the use journey journey for it. So really remember to think about who the, your target population is. So who are you thinking about and what the context is. So try to uh, like imagine how would these people behave in this specifically context and then try to identify what would be the behavioral bottleneck so why is the person not doing what uh, they should do if this would indeed be best for them and uh, you have 10 minutes for this uh, this is the journey map so think about like it's step by step so if your behavioral challenge is uh, a, a final outcome you have to to think every possible step that takes into this final action and then you compare what would be ideal to do in which step what is it like in reality and maybe hypothesize why does this happen so is this something in the st structure of the context or is it something regarding motivation or is it become it lacks information so then try to fill in in these squares we have sent you the google drive uh, folder link so don't forget to go there so you can all enter in the same slide, uh, see what's your number and then what's the number in the PowerPoint and then you can all fill it up together. Yeah, uh, so you have this in your worksheets and all you have to do is to complete it. So as an example with the challenge I've identified of a nudging uh, dog walkers to pick up their dog poop in front of my parents' house. So it would kind of look like this. So the ideal process is uh, they decide to take a walk with the dog, they take the leash and plastic bags to pick up the dog poop. They walk around with the dog and they pass in front of my parents' house. Step four, the dog stops to poop in front of my parents' house. Step five, owner takes out a plastic bag and pick it up. And step six, takes the dog poop and throw it away in the nearest a trash bin. So that's what ideally uh, the process would should look like. But in reality, they forget uh, many times to take a plastic bag. And um, when the dog is pooping, they look around to check nobody is watching. And then they leave. Uh, the, they live with the dog, living behind the dog poop. So some of the barriers you can find here is that, for instance, finding bags requires efforts because they're always hidden somewhere in the kitchen. Um, maybe they don't have plastic bags in their houses, in their homes uh, to take when they're walking their dog. Um, or maybe they prefer not to use plastic bags because uh, it requires money and it is expensive. So another barrier in this case is um, once they are with the dog and the dog is pooping, they don't have any back to pick up uh, their dog poop or um, they don't feel like there's a control or any punishment if they just leave the poop and leave it. 
And also some of the barriers here is that maybe they think, oh, I have done before. I have left the dog poop over there and nothing happens. So it is okay if I do it again or everyone do it or I see dog poop everywhere. So if everyone does it, why shouldn't I? So um, this, uh, this is an example of how you should complete the user journey. So I'm going to divide you in different groups again. Don't worry, you have this example and you have the template to complete it uh, related to your own challenges. Um, yeah. So see you in a bit. Is everyone back? I guess so, right? Yeah, um, I think everyone is back. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to introduce the last activity of today, which is actually to design and prototype our nudges. So based on the last exercise, you have to think about the behavior bottlenecks you listed and how could you intervene on it? How could you design something that would solve it? And uh, the, so first, keep in mind the definition of nudge. We put it, it, it in the slide in case you want to use it as a reference. And here are some quick and simple examples of some of the challenges we uh, said to you. So, for example, washing hands in a proper way. So they put the stones in order so people wouldn't forget how many times would be the ideal. And also, uh, for example, the stickers in the doors so people will remember that it might be uh, dangerous even though it seems clean. And yeah, so first you're going to fill up the same table, but this extra line here about potential nudge. So keep in mind the barriers and then act on it. Uh, I'll, do you want to explain or should we? Yeah, uh, so for instance, in my case, for each step and, and uh, in each step that there was a barrier, I thought about potential nudges. So for instance, making a guerrilla communication campaign in my parents' neighborhoods, or maybe putting, spraying my streets with not attractive smells so, so the dog don't poop in front of my parents' house. Also, I thought about different signs to put in front of my parents' house, so to nudge people uh, to pick up their dog poop or, or make them feel observed uh, with their bad behavior. So these are different nudges that I came up with for this particular challenge. And uh, we nudge you, we encourage you to do the same using the user journey. For each step, maybe you can think potential nudges uh, that you can implement. Uh, yes, and then you should pick one that you would like to prototype and work a bit more on it. And then uh, you can use the next slide to start doing a communication piece or something like that, as you imagine. And you have 15 minutes and then we'll go all back here and share what we've talked in the session. So I've already sent you the invites for the breakout rooms and 
you should be able to join to the same breakout rooms that you belong to. First, we'd like to open the space if any group wants to share what you have thought so far. Um, please feel free to just unmute you. We uh, were unable to finish it on the on the time we were we were supposed to, but we could maybe f think about some solutions to make people use the mask correctly to when when leaving home during this pandemic periods so one nudge we thought could be uh, interesting is like taking the ex example you you guys have shared with us like a guerrilla uh, communication because i think it's something that for me it's it's interesting but a lot of people I see back in Brazil, they don't know how to use the mask. They, they leave home using the mask, but they don't know how to, or they prefer not doing it. Like, I don't know, but they don't use it correctly. So maybe uh, if, if we have like a lot of information uh, uh, directed to those people, I think it's something that could work out. Yeah, communication is essential when you're um, trying to nudge uh, people's behavior. And there's a lot of uh, really cool insights about how to communicate more effectively. Um, people tend to pay attention to things that are attractive to our eyes. And if there's a lot of text, uh, we usually don't read it. So it's uh, really cool to always try to uh, make it simple and attractive. Anyone else who would like to share any thoughts? Okay. Um, yeah. Then to wrap it up, because we have seven I think minutes. Lucy here. Left. Oh yeah. To... Sorry. Huh? Sorry. Did, did you want you to share? Because um, you want to do. Well, yeah, sure. I can now start to talk. So basically. Uh, Okay, after we switched the groups, we were in uh, another group, but it was okay. And we were actually discussing and realized how hard it is actually to nudge people uh, buying local food because we at the end now realized the main barrier is the size of the city. And some of them are very practical and don't want to change they, their way, though if it's healthy or better for them. And then we realized basically by promoting local shops in general, we would be probably able to nudge uh, people even in bigger cities to choose uh, local food rather than big supermarkets. Uh, but yeah, maybe like from that point of view would be basically PR or flyers for discounts, etc. But yeah, yeah, more or less. I don't know if Heather wants to add something yeah, I think we we were saying that it has to be what you were saying, all that has to be simple and convenient for people. So it has to be easy for them to find the local produce rather than so that they don't go to the big supermarket to do their shopping, that it's, you know, it's on their way home and they know how to do it rather than having to go out of their way to buy local. So, yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Um, so there's something called the combi model that is developed by the University College London that says that a behavior of a person is uh, also influenced by the opportunity, physical and psychological, they have. So um, having the opportunity to have access to uh, organic local food, um, that's something really important in order to nudge people's behavior. Yeah, great work. I actually have a question. Uh, we did, we had as well uh, the face mask, uh, using a face mask correctly, the journey. And uh, everything we were talking about was something about information. But the information, it, you don't need it while, for example, you were leaving home and you forget to bring the mask. It's too late. So you cannot nudge many times in the journey. It should be done something before that. So actually, in most of the things was like, okay, it's not in this journey, it's like before. So it's just yeah, that, 
that is right, Leticia. Thank you for sharing uh, that thought. Um, what usually you can do is to uh, nudge them uh, like in some way in their journey and hoping that they remember the next time they start the journey. You know what I mean? Because of course you cannot like interrupt their in their own houses, homes to nudge them. So you kind of have to nudge them whenever you, you can uh, more uh, forward in their journey. And then you hope for them to remember next time they're going out to, to take out their masks. Yeah, yeah, and also, yeah. yeah, if this is the moment of, like, if the problem is that people forget to bring their masks, then in a way, as to remember. So if you're thinking about people who live with you, you can post a sign on the door so they won't forget at the moment they're leaving their houses. Or if you're thinking something in a larger scale, you can uh, think about social media campaigns or may maybe sending an SMS at the right moment that people... Uh, are supposed to leave their homes. So this is, would be included in the user journey, like the user journey starts before. But I'd also say the key factor would be a habit. A habit in people's behavior in general. Yeah, that is right. And that is one of the things that the UK government, for instance, was trying to do, like to um, try to make washing your hands a habit, uh, such as taking out your coat every time you come in your house or well, wash your hands. But habits are really hard to, to nudge uh, into people. So, yeah, it's, it's a huge challenge we have. So um, we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, Flora, maybe you want to share the final slides? Sorry, I was on mute. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. And yeah, oh, if you want to. Um, so um, the final challenge that we have is to First of all, thank you for sticking, up, sticking together uh, until the last uh, minute. But we kind of uh, want to motivate you to implement one or some of the nudges that you've came up with during this session. And what we are going to do is to do a follow-up with all of you, if you're okay, to see if you're willing to have another session after the festival is finished to kind of share a nudge or, or a thought that you have uh, uh, tried. Um, for instance, in my case, I'm actually implementing the different signs in front of my parents' house to see if I can nudge dog owners to pick up their dog poop. So in this uh, follow-up session, we'll kind of more relaxed and chilled, uh, share some experiences if you have uh, successfully implemented it, uh, if you haven't, uh, which were the limitations. And of course, this is completely optional, but one of the objectives of, the, of this session is, uh, was to try to form a nudge band. So we kind of uh, want to use this opportunity to start building an international community, um, practice community on people that are interested in using behavioral sciences. Yeah, and here are some useful links in case you wanted to learn more about how to apply it. So uh, the Behavior Insights team has a lot of material that are really uh, interesting and, and easy to use, and some of them we've used here today. And also the B-Hub has like a platform where they put a lot of cases so you can search from uh, for the area that you're interested at and you can feature. Uh, it's really nice. And also this blog, they post uh, really really interesting articles every week about several top different topics about, about behavioral science so yeah feel free to use it and to share it and yeah i think that's it oh just another uh, announcement in last week we're going to do a second panel on behavioral insights but this time we're going to share our experiences at, at working in government so me, all, and a friend from Colombia. And I hope if you're interested in knowing more about this topic, I hope you can join us as well. And all, if you want to add anything. Yeah, no, thank you so much for, for being here with us and, and sharing uh, this session with us uh, regarding the technical difficulties. Um, I was supposed to be a ninja on, on technological stuff because I'm a millennial, but 
not so much. So sorry for that. Um, but yeah, we'll write uh, to you again and we'll see if you're willing to have another more chilled session to share some experiences and thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to thank all. You. Bye, bye. Uh, bye. Oh yeah, Brenton. The, that's okay. No, no. Just thank you very much for, <laughs> uh, for a great job. Uh, I know everyone's going to get to the next meetings. Uh, we'll see you at the next uh, the next uh, event. And, and I really want to thank uh, Ol and Flora for really working the festival uh, metaphor right throughout their whole presentation. So I really enjoyed that. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.